Welcome to Science Pub. We're just going to jump right in here. Um, hi, my name is Tristan Mentry. I'm the programs coordinator at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. We want to thank our sponsor, Hub International, for sponsoring this free public program. We also want to remind you to support your favorite local businesses like our favorite Dargan's Irish Pub. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight. This is Corinne Haining Laverty. She is an author of the Los Angeles Times bestselling book, North America's Galapagos, the Historic Channel Islands Biological Survey. She is a research associate and a fellow at the Natural History Museum, Los Angeles County, a patrons circle member of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, an associate of the Santa Cruz Island Foundation, and a member of the All Eight Club. She has been published in Western North American Naturalist, Lonely Planet, Eco Traveler, and Whale Watcher, among other publications. So without further ado, our speaker, the lovely Corinne <laughs> Haining Laverty. Oh, well, Tristan, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, I am truly honored and thrilled to have been asked by the Santa Barbara Museum to present to your Science in the Pub speaker series. I know that this is a beloved series that you have um, been doing for some time. The participants are very loyal. I also suspect that they are very well versed in science and conservation and nature. And I really hope that all of you that joined us tonight are going to uh, enjoy the uh, pr program that I have uh, prepared for you. So let me share my screen. As you know, we are going to be discussing the Channel Islands tonight, the first inhabitants of which were the island Chumash and the island Tongva peoples. I hope that you will join me in extending our respect and gratitude to these original caretakers for their stewardship and conservation of the islands. Now, this book recounts the never before told adventures and ambitions of a group of researchers and naturalists who came together in the late 1930s to embark upon a series of unprecedented expeditions. Their mission to piece together the human history and biological evolution of California's eight channel islands. Now, there are two things that made this survey particularly unique. First of all, I do want to also mention that it was launched by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. But the two things that really made it unique were, first of all, the eight island focus, and secondly, the multidisciplinary nature of the expeditions. This had never been done before, and it has never been replicated. Now, before diving into the actual narrative of this book, I thought it might be helpful just to talk about the Channel Islands for a moment. And I know that many of you are very familiar with them, but there might be some folks that aren't quite as familiar as others. So with that, here they are, California's eight Channel Islands lying within the Southern California Bight like giant paint splatters on a Google Earth-sized Jackson Pollock canvas. Now, the islands didn't always look like this. In fact, millions of years ago, they lay submerged beneath the ocean surface here toward the bottom right of the screen near present day San Diego. And then through really complicated plate tectonics and geology, some of these rocks were dragged as much as 150 miles northward and rotated as much as 180 degrees clockwise. Then about 2 million years ago, they began rising out of the ocean in roughly the configuration that they are in today. Although there were certainly differences the islands tended to be larger, there were more of them, etc. But what I want you to get out of this little geology discussion is not so much the geology itself, although that's very important and interesting, but to, to remember that these islands were never attached to any terra firma that could have colonated them with plants or animals. That means everything that's on these islands had to get out there somehow and take hold survive and or evolve. Now, one of the differences between the islands was that originally the four northern channel islands were one mother island called Santa Rosa. So here, these sort of brown splotches toward the bottom of the slide, these are the current four northern channel islands. 
And the blue outline is the mother island, Santa Rosé. Santa Rosé was 76% larger than the current combined land mass of the four northern islands. And it lay much closer to mainland California than the islands do today. So here in this brown shape, we have the current coastline, uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura County coastline of California. And then outside of it, you have the former uh, coastline of the mainland. And you can see they were only about five miles apart. This meant that things had a pretty, you know, much easier time getting out to the Santa Rosé uh, originally because it was closer to shore. So things could swim over, they could raft over on logs, it could be blown by the wind, or of course they could um, fly over as well. Now there are some other differences between these groups of islands. Um, as you can see, the southern islands here are much further apart from one another than are the northern islands. They also have never been connected to the mainland, never been connected to each other, and have always been farther out to sea than the southern islands. So what that means is the northern islands have more species diversity on them than do the southern islands in terms of quantity and numbers. And you see a lot of... Um, uh, similarities between the northern islands and the mainland more so than you do perhaps on the southern islands. Another thing that's a little bit different about these islands is that, that the larger islands tend to be better, have more fresh water sources on them. And in fact, the two smallest islands, Anacapa and Santa Barbara, have virtually no fresh water on them at all. Anacapa only has one freshwater seep, and that's in a cave that's only accessible by um, the ocean. And Santa Barbara has no fresh water on it whatsoever, which means that everything that lives on those two little islands must rely on fall and rainwater for its uh, freshwater sustenance. So with that sort of as just a little bit of a background, let's get out and visit these islands. These channel islands, they are wild. Harsh. Thrilling. and spoiled, spoiled in terms of humankind's careless use of them through the introduction of exotic species such as horses, cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, rats, rabbits, agricultural crops. This is the uh, remnants of the now defunct winery on Santa Cruz Island. And while I might be one of the first people to say that every island deserves a little wine, perhaps we shouldn't be growing it on the islands and incidentally introduced plants as well, such as the fennel that has taken a very strong hold on Santa Cruz Island and is going to be tough to eradicate, if at all. Yet, these islands remain resilient in their unruly ability to resist domestication, no matter how forcefully we've attempted to enslave them for uses such as ranch lands, big game hunting parks, recreational venues, movie sets, and ship to shore firing ranges. Nonetheless, 150 plants and animals that either currently live or have made their homes on these eight scraps of land live nowhere else on the planet. Hence the island's nickname, North America's Galapagos. Now this is a photograph of just some of the animals that you might see if you visit the islands. And we don't have time to talk about them all, but I'll bring your attention to a couple of them. First of all, I promise we're gonna talk about the fox. Many of you probably do know the fairly recent story of this charismatic animal, but let's leave that for a moment. And let's take a look at this guy, the Santa, the, uh, Channel Island Scrub Jay. This jay is descended from the mainland scrub jay that many of us are familiar with. He's about 25% larger than the mainland jay and much more brightly hued. And he is the only endemic bird species on the Channel Islands. And there are other subspecies of birds that live only on the islands, but this jay is the only species of bird. He's also, and he lives only on Santa Cruz Island, although he was uh, at one point, uh, his remains, or at one point he did occupy Santa Rosa Island as well. But he's really quite a character. And if you go out to visit Santa Cruz, I'm sure you'll run into him because he's very loud and he's very bright. And he's always, he seems to be around everywhere. 
Now I want to bring your attention to this guy down here. This is in the lower sort of middle of the slide. This is the uh, Santa Catalina Island um, ornate shrew. And there's a couple things that I think are fun to know about this shrew. First of all, the, the um, Channel Islands Biological Survey scientists from the Natural History Museum thought that they would find shrews on the larger of the Channel Islands because they felt that the ecosystems there would support this animal, but no shrew had ever been found on any of the Channel Islands until 1939 or 1940 when Jacqueline Bloker Jr., the survey's mammologist and bat expert, got his hands on a specimen. And the manner in which he received or got this specimen is really quite a story and I go into it in the book and I'm not going to spoil it for you, but when he first got the specimen he wrote it up as though it was its own distinct species of shrew and later on over the years when he re-examined it he um, decided to downgrade it to a subspecies which is what it is currently thought of. Um, but still shrews tend to be relatively rare on the islands and they're only found on Santa Catalina. Okay, so let's talk about, oh, this is uh, an example of an animal that lived only on the Channel Islands that has gone extinct, the Channel Islands pygmy mammoth. Now, um, the pygmy mammoth descended from the Columbia mammoth who occupied the mainland. And um, it is believed that between 20 and, or 18 and 20,000 years ago, or 40,000 years ago, or perhaps even longer, Colombian mammoths swam across the channel to occupy Santa Rosa. And then over time, some of their young evolved into the pygmy mammoth, which is the smallest mammoth to live ever in North America and among the smallest mammoths in the world. But what I think is most interesting about the pygmy mammoth is just not that it's a cute five foot, seven foot uh, mammoth, but that it actually evolved to occupy a different ecological niche than the Columbia mammoth. It ate different types of food. The Columbia mammoth is a grass eater and the pygmy mammoth ate barks and leaves. Additionally, its muscles and skeletal structure actually evolved and changed so that it had what amounted to four-wheel drive ambulatory abilities. And this let it get up very steep island slopes to reach, uh, reach, reach all of the different environments on the northern islands. So today, when, and it also had a braking function, so it could kind of get down those same slopes. So today, when scientists go out to look for mammoth remains, they find the, the Columbia mammoths on the lower grassland areas of the islands, but they only, but they find pygmy mammoth remains all over the islands. So on the grasslands, as well as on ridge lines and on steep slopes. So I think that's kind of a nice um, story as well. And both of these mammoths went extinct about 13,000 years ago. All right, I told you we'd talk about the fox. Um, the Channel Islands fox is, uh, has six distinct subspecies that lives on all but the two smallest islands, Anacapa and Santa Barbara Island, although some fox remains have relatively recently been found on Anacapa, although it's not known whether those remains were, um, you know, if those foxes were living on the island or if they were brought to the island. But I think it's pretty interesting that they've now been found there. Now this little guy who's about six pounds in weight, maybe 10 pounds at the largest, evolved from the much larger mainland gray fox. And he evolved into the smallest canid in North America and among the smallest dogs in the world. It's thought that about 6,000 years ago, Native Americans brought the gray fox to the Channel Islands and from there it evolved into its cute calendar worthy self. Um, and what, but what I think is, most wonderful about this fellow is that he has a fearless heart. If you go out and visit the islands that he lives on, it's fairly likely that within a relatively short amount of time, this fox or his whole family is going to come out and wander about wherever you are and completely ignore you. It really has a fearless heart. And I think in part this is because the Channel Islands fox, even as small as it is, is the top terrestrial predator on the Channel Islands. Now, bald eagles are larger than foxes, but they are primarily fish eaters. So I'm speaking just from a terrestrial um, point of view. However, its status as the top terrestrial predator did nothing to prevent it from going nearly extinct on all six islands that it inhabits as recently as 1999. And to give you an idea of the magnitude of this near extinction event, in 1994, 
it was estimated that on Santa Rosa Island alone, there were about 1,800 Santa Rosa Island foxes living on that island. By 1999, that number had dwindled to 14 or 15 individual animals. And that decline was mirrored on all of the islands that it inhabited in, in greater or lesser extents. But it was a very severe um, reduction in population on all the islands. And it was a very difficult problem for conservation managers, for the park service, for the government to solve because the problems were all a little bit different on each of the islands, but it had to do with DDT poisoning that made the bald eagles go extinct on the Channel Islands. It had to do with introduced ungulates and then the golden eagles coming in from Los Padres National Forest and inhabiting the islands where they could feast on small you know, sheep and pigs and things like that. And, and then when the uh, un introduced ungulates began being removed from the islands, there really was very little for the eagles to eat except for foxes and skunk. But luckily through the concerted effort of NGOs, the US Navy, the Park Service, conservation managers, private people, all sorts of fellow people ga gathered together to save this fox. The Channel Islands fox has recovered on each of the islands that it lives on. And today it is being monitored to ensure that this kind of um, catastrophe is avoided in the future. Now, in addition to being sort of a heartwarming story about something that humans can do to undo the damage that they do, something else is important to think about when you think about the story. And that is that islands are fragile ecosystems. The things that live on islands evolved in isolation. And when we begin introducing plants or animals that weren't there originally, sometimes it can have catastrophic um, side effects that we didn't envision. So hopefully that's not gonna happen to our foxes again. So for the botanists and gardeners out there, I wanted to give you a tiny sample of some plants that live only on the Channel Islands. This is the Santa Barbara Island Live Forever. Um, it is only found on one square mile of land in this entire world. And that is a little island that's floating out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Santa Barbara Island. And remember, there is no fresh water on this island. So this plant relies solely on rainwater and fog for its freshwater sustenance. And on the other side of the size spectrum, we have the Santa Rosa Island Torrey Pine. This pine tree is related to the Santa Barbara, I mean the uh, San Diego Torrey Pine. It's among the rarest pine trees in the world, and it is found only on Santa Rosa Island in two groves on that island. And I will say that because Santa Rosa Island is part of the National Park Service, Channel Islands National Park, you can fairly easily get to this island and then take this beautiful walk up along Betcher's Bay. This, it's, it's a gorgeous, easy walk up to the grove of trees and visit them if you're so inclined. Now, in addition to um, these endemic plants and animals, other species of animals rely heavily on the Channel Islands for their species survival too. And that includes seabirds who really uh, need predator-free environments because they are ground nesting birds. So that means they sort of just sit on the ground and hollow out a little area for their nest. They lay their eggs on the ground, they hatch their young on the ground, and then they fledge them right there on the ground. So you can imagine if there are cats or rats or snakes or coyotes or whatever on the islands that causes these animals a lot of problem. And in fact, when the Channel Islands biological researchers were on the Channel Islands, they did note that the birds, especially on Santa Barbara Island and um, Anacapa Island, which was traditionally predator free, didn't have foxes or skunks on it, or even mice, well, no mice, excuse me, didn't have foxes or skunks on it, um, those bird populations were suffering. And I'm happy to say that now with the removal of the predators on these various islands, the seabirds are making a comeback and there are many species that um, have really returned strongly to the islands. Now, archeology span is also an incredibly important part of the Channel Islands story. In fact, the Park Service deems the sites on the Northern Islands to be among the most valuable in North America, if not the world. Now, this sentiment is echoed by a well-known Channel Islands researcher from the Smithsonian, who states that the archeological record plays a role in research issues and questions of global significance. So what are these questions of global significance? Well, one of them is the manner in which and timing of when North America was first populated. Most of us who are on this Zoom call 
were taught as children when we studied how North America was populated, that people came to North America by walking across the Bering Land Bridge, then through the ice-free corridor of Canada into the central part of the United States and settled in a place um, that's close to Clovis, New Mexico. And that was called the Bering Land Bridge theory of habitation or the Clovis first theory. And while that did happen, and it happened about 13,000 years ago, based on significant evidence that has been found on the Channel Islands, as well as other sites in North and South America, a new theory of occupation has taken hold. And this theory, the Pacific Coastal Migration Model, holds that people with maritime capabilities use boats to follow the shoreline northward from Siberia, cross the Bering Sea, and then follow the coastline of what is now Alaska, Canada, North and South America, and of course settled on in the Channel Islands during this process. And not only did they have boats and, and seafaring abilities, but they were able to use all the marine resources at their disposal to survive during this uh, migration route. It's thought that people probably came to North America now thought between 14 and 18,000 years ago and perhaps even longer. And as I said, the Channel Islands have be, played a critical role in the development and the uh, believability of this new model. And that is because there are significant sites on the Channel Islands that lead it, lend its significance. First of all, there is a preponderance of sites on the Channel Islands that date to 9,000 years of age or older. And remember, these are now sites that are on the existing Channel Islands, but the islands were much larger. San Jose was 76% larger than the land mass is today. So there are probably or potentially there are sites, early coastal sites that are now underwater that if we could find those might even um, show that people were there longer than 14 or 18,000 years ago. And yes, there are some studies being conducted today that are hoping to find some kind of evidence uh, that can be used to support or discredit that kind of um, theory. Additionally, we have some really important sites that um, are found nowhere else in North America. One of them is here on San Miguel Island. This photograph in the lower right hand picture is San Miguel Island. This in the foreground is a shell midden. Many of you are familiar with that, but if you're not, a midden site is a place where people threw the everyday detritus of life that was no longer necessary. So if they ate an abalone mussel, they what might throw the shell away in a pile. If they had mus you know, um, mussels or broken knife blade or fish hook or something, they could put it in this pile as well. And sometimes there is matter found in these midden sites that can be carbon dated. And indeed on San Miguel Island, there's a complex called Daisy Cave. And within Daisy Cave was found something that was carbon dated that allowed scientists to say that people had used that cave site for um, as long ago as 12,000 years ago, making it the oldest shell midden ever found in North America. Likewise, in this picture on the left, this black and white photograph, something really remarkable was found. Now I'm gonna digress just for a moment and tell you about this picture because this photo was snapped in December, on November, December, 1941 by Jack Kofer. Jack Kofer was the youngest member of the Channel Islands Biological Survey. He was 16 years old when he set foot on Santa Rosa Island in November of 1941. His mother actually had to write him a permission slip so he could go and miss school and attend and be part of this survey. But um, Jack and his buddy, a teenage uh, researcher also at the, uh, uh, or a helper at the Natural History Museum were here nearby at Tecolote Canyon looking for mammoth remains when Jack took this picture. Now this canyon here, this sort of V-shaped or arrow-shaped canyon is one that is familiar I know to many scientists and archaeologists, especially at the Natural History Museum of Santa Barbara. Uh, this is Arlington Canyon. And you may know that Phil Orr, who was a archaeologist and anthropologist with the Santa Barbara Museum for many years, studied on Santa Rosa Island. And in the 1950s, he found eroding out of the cliff site here, it, you know, a little bit more interior here, but he found human remains eroding out of this cliff. 
He thought he should bring them back to the museum, which is exactly what he did. He carbon dated them. And then years later, within the last decade, I'm not sure exactly how um, recently, but I believe it's been within the last decade, the museum under John Johnson's leadership has recarbon dated them and definitively been able to say that these remains that are at the Santa Barbara Museum are the oldest human remains ever found in North America. They date to at least 13,000 years of age. So all of this taken together gives a lot of um, support to the Pacific Coastal Migration Model. So as you can see, there's really a lot of interesting things out there on these Channel Islands, and people were aware of that way back even in the 1800s. So it's not really surprising that the Channel Islands Biological Survey participants wanted to get out there and, and study the islands, but it had never been done in the manner in which they undertook. So whose bright idea was this anyway? Well, credit for that goes to this man, Donald C. Meadows in 1930. Nine, when the Channel Islands Biological Survey was launched, Don Meadows was a 41-year-old high school biology teacher in Long Beach, California, a lepidopterist with a personal collection of 20,000 butterflies. And he was a very ambitious man. He left his teaching job in Long Beach, California in the height of the Great Depression to get his master's degree from UC Berkeley. He studied under Joseph Grinnell. And the reason he did this is he wanted to attain a teaching position in higher education. So he went and got this master's degree, but then he found himself back in the Long Beach school system. Now there's nothing wrong with being a high school teacher, but he wanted something else for himself. So he got this great idea that he would get a PhD and he would use um, some research that had never been done before, an eight island survey of the Lepidoptera on the Channel Islands as the basis of his research paper or his thesis. And then he would attain this teaching position and the higher, uh, the, the position, um, he would attain the PhD, I'm sorry, and the teaching position to which he aspired. But he realized that this was a pretty big undertaking. And he figured he might need some help. So he went to this man, John Adams Comstock, who was the director of science at the Natural History Museum of LA County and himself a lepidopterist. Now Comstock was a very talented man. He was actually a medical doctor. He was an arts and crafts man. He was a illustrator and a writer. He uh, produced a lot of science and he was really a visionary and he saw merit in Meadows proposal, but he saw it as something that should be much bigger. He envisioned it as not only an eight island survey of the Lepidoptera, but he wanted all the sciences involved. He wanted geology and mammalogy and ornithology and archeology. span He wanted it all. And he saw that the fieldwork portion of this survey alone should last for five years so that multiple uh, collections could be made during different times of the year. He wanted his scientists to go out and make collections, then bring them back into the laboratory for scientific examination and study. Then he expected them to write up uh, scientific peer reviewed articles about their findings, to follow that with popular articles for the press, and then to develop museum displays. And for those of you who um, haven't been to the, the Santa Barbara Museum recently, there are lots of really great Channel Islands displays there. And so I encourage you to go if you have some time over the holidays here. Now, so in Christmas Eve of 1938, Meadows and Comstock presented this proposal to the Honorable Board of Governors and it had the eight island focus and the multidisciplinary approach. And lo and behold, the Board of Governors approved it. But if you think about it, this is a pretty amazing feat that they accomplished because in Europe, we had another world war brewing. The, com the country itself was still suffering the effects of the Great Depression. And Los Angeles was mired by police racketeering and political corruption. And this five-year survey was no small undertaking. So how did Comstock get this approved? Well, he did it by including one very shrewd provision. He promised the Board of Governors that this five-year project would cost the museum and the county nothing additional over and above the regular staff salaries of the museum scientists involved. 
That meant that Don Meadows here, the citizen scientist and his Long Beach teacher friends could certainly participate in the survey, but they would not get paid. Additionally, the scientists themselves were responsible for providing all of their own personal camping equipment. They had to buy their own food and hire their own camp cook. And most vexing of all, they had to find transportation to and from the islands and between the islands for themselves and their considerable gear. Now, this truly was probably the biggest hurdle they had to overcome, but Comstock was able to patch together a couple of really great partners that provided constant um, free transportation, although it was always um, at the whim of these providers' schedules, but it did happen. They did have to take the Great White Steamer here at least once to Catalina. So in uh, um, February 1939, this Channel Islands survey was launched. The first, uh, oh, let me tell you now, I want to introduce you to a couple other of the scientists besides Comstock and Meadows. I mentioned Jack von Bloker Jr. He was the mammalogist and bat expert. He was driven, he was compulsive, and he was flawed. And I have to say he was my favorite character, of course. Um, he was a really great field collector. He loved to collect things and he did a good job of that. Excuse me, but he also, was good about bringing his um, collections back to the laboratory for scientific examination. And then he published um, them about them significantly. He too held a, a master's degree from Berkeley. He also studied under Joseph Grinnell and Grinnell encouraged von Blocher to continue his work on the land mammals of the Southern California islands as he pursued his PhD and that is something that von Blocher pursued for the next quarter century with vehemence. And I won't give it away to tell you what happened. But before I leave this um, page, I just wanna bring your attention to this photograph on the right side of the screen, this uh, picture of Jack. He's on San Clemente Island. Um, see, he has a cigarette in his mouth. He was always smoking. Uh, these are two Santa Cana, uh, San Clemente Island foxes that he um, caught. And in the middle is a feral cat. And remember, he was a very strong, uh, opponent of non-native animals on the Channel Islands, and he did his part during the survey to get rid of them when he could. Now, the next person that was really important to the survey was Art Woodward. Art was the Director of Anthropology and History, and I owe him a debt of gratitude as well because he left wonderful field notes that I used quite a bit in my research and quoted from, and he added a lot of color to the whole um, survey itself. But Art also studied at Berkeley. He was there for two years studying under Krober, who was a very well-known anthropologist. However, he left Berkeley two years, uh, after two years, and he never went back to college. Um, he was more different than Met from Meadows and from Bloker than you can imagine in a Hollywood script. He was sort of a rabble rouser. He liked what he liked, let you know what he didn't. He always liked to keep things stirred up. And despite the fact that he didn't publish a lot about his time on the Channel Islands, he is credited with bringing a new level of scientific rigor to archaeological investigations on the islands. Well, they went to San Clemente Island five different times. And on the first major expedition to San Clemente Island, Jack von Blocher was there and he wanted to find bats. So he went to the Marines on this island and they took him to this cave, which looks like a bat cave to me. But when they walked inside, instead of finding a ceiling swarming with warm winged creatures hanging by their toes and a cave floor soft with guano, their, their boots dug into dry sand and their fingers retrieved bits of a rope, shell, and bones, and they knew they had found um, a Native American site. One of the first things that they found in this cave was a large ceremonially buried dog, so they named the cave Big Dog Cave. And then on subsequent ex um, expeditions, they pretty thoroughly excavated the cave's contents. And what they found was actually quite remarkable. As you can see here in this left-hand photo, the uh, cave was sighted above the ocean, and what happened was ocean salt spray got into the cave and basically preserved or pickled all of the various items in the cave. So organic matter that frequently deteriorates in inland sites or mainland sites were found intact. 
They found pieces of mission cloth, blue and brown mission cloth, yellow and brown mission cloth. They found otter fur. They found a piece of a Spanish uh, leather shoe, a woman's shoe. They found boat a uh, wooden boat material, even the prow of a boat that still had a piece of rope attached. So these were really remarkable finds that they made in this cave and um, that they excavated. And it's really a good thing too, because today this cave is completely off limits to military and civilian personnel alike, because it's on San Clemente Island, which is the Navy's only live ship to shore firing range and access is just too dangerous. So, um, one of Art Woodward's really greatest interests was the lone woman of San Nicolas Island, and he was just enamored with her story. He wanted to find her whalebone hut site, and so he took the, um, well, before I go into that, maybe I can just spend one moment here talking about this beautiful oil painting that was painted by Holly Harmon. She's a local Santa Barbara artist, and she worked with um, well-known researchers to develop this painting that is believed to be the most accurate rendition of what she might look like. There are no photographs of the lone woman available. Her story was fictionalized and made famous in the 1960s by Scott O'Dell's Island of the Blue Dolphins. And today, there's so much fascinating information coming out about her life. Um, I do write about that in the book, and I don't have a tremendous amount of time to go through it tonight. I apologize. But um, it's really fascinating what we're learning. Her people were taken off the island in 1835. She was left alone there for various, uh, there's various theories about it, but I think it's becoming more and more clear what really happened. And then in 1853, George Nidever was commissioned. Well, he'd gone a couple of times to look for her, but he was asked to bring her back. And she came back to the island, to the mainland, and unfortunately died seven weeks later. But her story was something that captivated Art Woodward and he wanted to find her whalebone hut. So he took the memoir that uh, George Nidever had dictated and he followed his footsteps across the island until he found what he believed was her hut site. And he took photographs along the way. So he created a photo documentary. Um, and this is what he believed was her hut site. There are 19 whale bones lying here in the foreground of this photograph. This is Reggie Lambert, the island caretaker. And he believed this was her, her hut site that has been discredited today. There's just too many sites on this particular area to say one particular one might be hers, but he thought it was hers. And he went so far as on a later expedition to recreate the hut and he sat inside of it, one of his archaeological assistants who had dark hair, short dark hair, and he photographed her from um, behind as though she might have been the lone woman herself. Okay, so we're about ready to wrap up, but I want to talk a little bit about the participants on the survey. All, all in all, there were 33 men and women who participated. That included citizen scientists like um, Don Meadows and his Long Beach teacher friends. It included at least one immigrant. This is George Kanikoff right here. He worked for the museum as their invertebrate specialist. He immigrated from Russia at the age of 26. It included young people like John Schrader and Jack Kofer and Harry Fletcher, who I've mentioned, teenagers who participated in the survey, and women. Now, this woman standing with her back to us is Ona von Bloker. She was Jack's wife and served as his uh, field assistant and camp cook, unpaid, of course. And she logged more time on the island than many of the researchers themselves. So I give her a lot of credit. And then finally, I want to uh, point out this woman here, this uh, woman right here in the middle of the table. Her name is Marion Hollenbach. And Marion, along with one other woman, Barbara Loomis, who became Art Woodward's wife, and um, they spent the rest of their lives together. Uh, but those two women, Barbara and Marianne, are believed to be the first trained female archaeologists to have ever worked on the Channel Islands, and they participated in the survey. So all in all, a pretty um, diversified group, especially for the time, I think. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Santa Rosa Island was expedition number 13. There were two camps. There was the main camp here at Camp Night Ever near Vale and Vickers Ranch House, and that was the archaeologist primarily. And then over here at Tecolote Canyon, the teenagers Jack Kofer and Harry Fletcher were there at the elephant camp digging up these beautiful uh, mammoth jawbones. When on December 7th, 
1941. It was Jack Cover's 17th birthday that day. The Vaqueros rode up to the um, to where these fellows were working in a steep cliff face and said, Pearl Harbor's been bombed. The West Coast has been blacked out. The ship traffic has been closed down. The ports are closed. We can't use our radio phone. We don't know how and when you're going to get back to the mainland, but you need to pack up camp and go back and be with the rest of your staff. Well, they did not know how they were going to get off this island, but leave it to John Adams Comstock to somehow commandeer this boat, the schooner Santa Cruz. It was the cattle boat that got cattle on and off of one of the islands that went out and picked up the researchers one day later than originally planned. This effectively ended the Channel Islands Biological Survey, cut short to war, um, 13 there were 13 expeditions, every island was visited at least once, and there were at least 49 scholarly publications that came out of this work. And that is the end of the Channel Islands Biological Survey and my talk. Thank you. That was wonderful, Corinne. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so now everyone, we're going to jump straight into our Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, take a moment and go down and write your questions in and we'll get to as many as possible. Wow, Corinne, that's so much to unpack and so many <laughs> different directions that, you know, your book could have taken. Um, so one question that came up from Smith was, what was the hardest part of this writing process? Well, that's an interesting question and an easy one for me to answer because I'm not a scientist, but I do have some background in natural history and I've done naturalist work and been involved in conservation organizations since I was in my 20s. But there was one aspect that I didn't have any exposure to. And I had written about 50 pages of my manuscript, which I sort of envisioned originally just to be, well, they went here and then they went there and they found this and they found that and that would be the end of the story. But as I wrote about it, I tried to infuse more character and motivations into the people. But I, I gave my work 50 pages to an editor and the editor said lots of nice things about it. But he said, you know, this you have to find a bigger meaning in this story. And I knew what that bigger meaning was and I was afraid of it because I didn't have any experience in it. And that was the archeological story. Mm -hmm. I had gone to enough conferences at this time and read enough material that I knew about this Pacific coastal migration model and I had never heard of it. And I always sort of thought that I was a fairly well-educated natural science person, but I didn't know about this. And I thought, well, maybe other people don't either, but I didn't know anything about archeology, span so it scared me. And I decided that I had to find an archeologist who would work with me as I wrote the book. And luckily I was steered toward a professor emeritus, Mike Glasow, who I think of as being the godfather of archeology span on the Channel Islands. He was out on those islands back in the 70s, early 70s. He has many, many, many graduate students that studied under him and continue to study the Channel Islands. And Mike graciously agreed to read my book chapter by chapter as I wrote it. And, and that gave me the courage to try to understand the archeology span and to try to write about it, knowing that I had a professional who would make sure that I didn't make any gross errors. And, and Mike did a great job. He was fast, he was kind, and he was really helpful. I couldn't have done it without him. That was hard. Yeah, well, thank <laughs> you. Okay, um, next question, Donna had asked, we saw that the, in the, your pictures that some dogs were on the island and we now know that there's feral cats and such. So have any of those animals brought new diseases or is there anything we know about um, in that? Well, um, there were a lot of dogs on the Channel Islands, which I think was really interesting. That was some of, one thing that I really enjoyed learning about when I did the research, because I love dogs. And, and so it was fun to learn how, what roles they played on the islands with the Native Americans. As far as introducing diseases, the dogs, what I know of the dogs from this time period was that they were traded. So they weren't like the foxes that sort of evolved into specific subspecies, but they were a constant commodity that was traded among the islands and the mainland. And as to the introduction of diseases, um, you know, it was thought 
when the foxes were having their troubles in the 1990s, that at least on Catalina Island, that it could be caused by distemper, distemper introduced by dogs. But they later, the scientists later isolated it to more likely having come from raccoons with distemper. Um, but this is something, I mean, I know that is true, but in more of a broader sense, I really can't address the bigger question that's being asked. And I'm sorry, I just don't have the answer and don't want to, <laughs> don't want to say something that's not accurate. That's okay. I also want to um, just congratulate you. Um, Luke, our CEO, um, has put in the chat that you are a new member of our board of trustees. So I just want to congratulate you and welcome you, Corinne. Thank you. I'm excited to be part of the museum. That's awesome. Okay, more questions. Um, could you talk about how the large Rosé Island became four smaller islands? Sure, sure. You know, as the Ice Age ended, when the Ice Age was, you know, upon us, the four northern islands were really heavily forested in general. Um, and then as the world warmed and the oceans, the ice melted, the, the water just rose up and subsumed the lower areas of the islands. And in fact, it crawled up, it's estimated, the water crawled up about 360 feet up San Jose and started breaking up these islands. And you know, when you go out to visit them, especially if you look at um, Santa Rosa and uh, San Miguel, or Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz, you can almost see them touching each other. You know, those two islands, those two, those two ends of those islands really look alike. And you know, in fact, they were once one island. And today you can see that happening and in Catalina too, you know, there's two harbors. You have Cat Harbor and um, oh, what's the other one? Um, oh gosh, I can't remember it right now, but the two harbors, is, they're only a half mile isthmus. And with the way things are going, I would guess that that's not gonna last for long. And you know, it'll still be Catalina like Anna Kappa, but uh, it's, it could very well become separated at some point. Wow. Um, Peter asks, do you know how many surveys of the Channel Islands have occurred historically? I, I couldn't give you a number for that, but I know that one of the earlier ones was uh, in, I think it was 1916, the uh, California Academy of Sciences did a fairly extensive survey of the um, reptiles, uh, the lizards on the islands. And then in the 1960s, um, the Navy in conjunction, uh, the Navy did some bird banding surveys on the islands and looking at seabirds on the islands. There have been plenty of surveys or at least investigations and researchers who have been out on the islands throughout, you know, many, the last couple hundred years. Yeah, so lots of them. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, Donna asks, were the islands private property? Yes, they were. Many of them were. Pardon me? I'm sorry, all of them? Uh, yeah, they were all private property. They were many of the islands were given by Spanish land grants to various people who then took possession of them. The um, military bought San Clemente Island in 1934 and started using it. Um, and so these, these, and the you know the Wrigley family was one of the owners of Catalina Island. That the Banning brothers, and it went through a, a succession of uh, ownership. In fact, I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but one fun fact about Catalina is that uh, William Rigby, Wrigley had his cubs in Chicago and he brought them out to the to Santa, uh, Santa Catalina Island for spring training. And the original Wrigley Field is actually was on Santa Catalina Island and they that what came before the Wrigley Field in Chicago. Really? Yeah. So, you know, these islands, they, they have these great histories of human use in the last 200 years, and they were sort of sold and utilized and leased sort of illegally or used without leases. And um, eventually, though, the now the four, the Channel Islands National Park is owned, obviously, by the U.S. government. San Nicolas Island and San Clemente are um, military bases, and Catalina is still in the conservancy hands that is owned primarily by the Wrigley heirs and managed, you know, for education, conservation, and uh, recreation uses. Wow, I had no idea. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, Chris Coulter asks, um, which of the islands have you personally visited and what were your impressions of the experiences? Oh, well, I'm lucky enough to have gotten to see all of the islands um, and they're all so different and beautiful and unique. And it might seem odd, but one of the last islands that I was able to go to, it's part of Channel Islands National Park, but the pier washed out several years ago. So it became very difficult to visit. And once it opened up with a dive boat that went out, um, I went to the island and it's only one square mile. And you think that, oh, what could be there? But there's sort of this, it's just so beautiful. It's, it's just, it feels very mild the time I was there. It's just this rolling hills and the birds were breeding, the seabirds were there. Brown boobies are now found offshore on Sutil Island and you have the peregrine falcons. And um, it, it, I loved, I really loved Santa Barbara Island and there was lots of pinnipeds. But I love them all. I love San Miguel. I love the stories on these islands. Santa Cruz is amazing. It's huge. It's quite an island. They're all, and I love, you know, Santa Rosa. Catalina has always been one of my favorites. I love them all. <laughs> yeah, and you're a member of the All Eight Club, which means you've been to All Eight, right? Yes, yes. That's awesome. Um, so there's a lot of questions coming in about more um, remains. Um, have you found have, uh, is there a record remains of bald eagles? Have you found any, um, or have they found any remains under the water surrounding the islands? Um, so yeah. All right, so remains, uh, specifically bird remains, is that what the question is about? One of them, yes, was about bald eagle remains and another one was about around, around the water in the right. water. All right. Um, Bald eagles have are native to the Channel Islands, so there's lots of evidence of bald eagles. And also, the Santa Barbara Museum has one of the premier researchers on Channel Islands birds on staff, and that's Paul Collins. And he would be much more qualified to answer any bird question than I'll ever be qualified to answer. But yes, lots of bird remains have been found on the islands. There used to be a flightless goose that they have, you know, it's gone extinct, but that is one of the um, special animals that's there. And as far as the archaeological research going on underwater, um, there is, there, there right now, it's my understanding that they're, they're looking for a lot of freshwater seeps that would be underwater because the thought is that people needed fresh water to establish uh, home sites. And they think that this might be a way of finding potential archaeological um, artifacts if they find freshwater seats that sort of fit into the old Santa Rosa map area, if you will. And so that is ongoing research that's being done. And I don't have a lot of update to give you for that. But it's exciting to think yeah. something new might happen. Um, all right, Scott asked a great question about um, history of human uh, humans being on the islands and in you know the Americas. So there's been um, they found human artifacts 33,000 years ago in Mexico, and we're finding stuff on the islands. So um, what do you think this this means? Does it mean that people were roaming throughout the Americas a lot earlier than we thought it was? Yes, I think that's what it means. <laughs> you know, more and more evidence is being found in North and South America that point to earlier human occupation than we ever knew or ever thought before. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of ways that we can uh, find evidence that people have existed. There can be, I think there's been some footprints that have been found that were able to be dated. There's been human um, waste that has been found in other sites that can be dated. Um, and, you know, if you can find, anyway, so there's other ways of um, being able to determine that people were around and they are believing that people have been here longer than we thought, which is exciting. Okay, just a few more questions and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a great one from Barbara. If you were to work on another survey or a survey yourself on the islands, what would you want to do? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I would be happy doing just about anything. Uh, I know there's some really great research going on right now with 
with the island fence lizards, which I'm not a real reptile person, but I think it's really interesting to think that you could still maybe find new species. You know, there's, there's the fence lizards are on the islands. They are considered subspecies of the mainland fence lizard, but there's a thought that perhaps maybe the one on San, San Nick might be its own species. So it's so fascinating to me that you know, we're still finding new species. We think we know it all, but we don't. And, you know, other kind of research, I think it'd be fun to do archaeology. I, and I'm, I love the whole idea about the dogs and the foxes and just learning more about them. You know, it's all really great stuff. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, maybe this is a good one to end on. Um, what in your past led you to write this book and to start this expedition? Well, uh, uh, I actually had a different idea originally and I went to the Natural History Museum of LA County and presented my idea to the archivist and the person who was in charge of um, scholarly publications. And the archivist who has unfortunately since passed away, she said, you know, if you're gonna go to all that trouble, you need to write this story up. And she pushed these boxes at me that were labeled Channel Islands Biological Survey 1938 to 1941. And she said, it's never been told and it's important. And I sort of rolled my eyes in the back of my head because it sounded so boring, the Channel Islands Biological Survey of 1938 to 1941. But I thought, well, if this is the opportunity that's being given to me, I will, you know, investigate it. And as soon as I opened those boxes and I saw the handwritten letters, the correspondence, the memos to file, the progress reports, the photographs, the newspaper articles, I really fell in love with the people on the islands. And I always wanted to write a book. That was something I kind of came up with when I was in seventh grade. I said, I'm going to write a book one day. And I've been a writer you know, on the side, I had a banking career, but I always wrote. And this was something that I then became very passionate about and really loved it. And it fit in with my natural history interests. That's amazing. Well, thanks so much, Corinne. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, please come back next month for another virtual science um, pub from home. Um, and that's it. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye.